Um, I want to take a few minutes and continue the series of messages that we've been working through for the last month and a half or so. And um, obviously it was interrupted last week when Ray Underwood came to speak for us. And uh, by the way, did you enjoy Ray last week? thought he did a great job. And I, um, you know, Ray and I have known each other for a long, long time. And, um, and I'm not sure where he came up with 10 years because it's been a whole lot longer than that. But it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I'd call that old age, amnesia, Alzheimer's, dementia, something sudden in just... When you see him, tell him I said all those things. And, um, but anyway, I thought he did a great job. And um, I was, Karen and I were watching it coming down I-75 on my phone. So, uh, you yeah. know, so there's no excuse not to be at the Grace Place, folks. The only excuse I can think of is 33,000 feet. And most of the planes have Wi-Fi now, so there's not even an excuse to miss it then. How about that? All right. Um, so... I want to say a big thank you to him for coming. But I'm going to pick up this series of messages that we've entitled The Unseen War, um, Living Victoriously in a Very Broken World. And um, today I'm going to talk to us about living faithfully in a broken world. Now, I've shared with you that, um, that when it comes to the unseen war, the battle takes place on three fronts. Uh, and as in any war or military um, endeavor, generally there's two or three fronts where battles are being fought. And the Bible tells us that one of those fronts where the battle is being fought is what we've been talking about quite a bit up to this point, and that's the flesh. It's this sin nature that you and I are born with. It is this inner compulsion to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. And um, it's really the kind of struggle that Paul talks about in um, Romans chapter 7. And so we talked, we talked about that problem of how just really we struggle and have this incredible battle with the flesh. And, um, and the second area is with the world. And, um, and what that means is this, that not only do I have this internal war going on around me and around you, we have this external war going on called the world. That's the culture we live in. And that's why it is so important that we live with a vertical focus in life. Because when I live with this world being the primary focus of my life, then I'm going to live by a value system that measures success in the wrong kind of ways. I'm going to live by attitudes that are not reflecting the kind of attitude that God wants us to have. I'm going to live with priorities that are focused on my desires, rather than fulfilling God's purpose for my life. So our culture, our world, is constantly attacking us. So this unseen war that goes on is something that happens on the inside. It's something that happens all around us in the world. And we're going to be talking about that in a few minutes. And then the third area of attack is the devil. And you know, the Bible tells us that Satan has fiery arrows directed towards us which means that he knows my vulnerable areas. He knows your vulnerable areas. And what does he do? He attacks us and attacks us and attacks us in those areas. That's why it is so important that we understand that God says, I want you to realize that you are fighting an unseen war. The key thing for us to keep in mind is this, that the Bible makes it very, very clear that even though we are in this war, it's not a battle, it's not a war to lose. It is a war to win. And just as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, when it comes to battling the flesh, that whenever we walk with the Spirit of God, that we experience God's power to work in an unbelievable way in our life, helping us to become more than conquerors and helping us to overcome the flesh the world, and the devil. And that is exactly what God's looking for. So we're not talking about an unseen war that is focused on being defeated by it. We're talking about an unseen war. We need to be aware it is going on. And then understand that through the power of the Spirit of God at work in our lives, we can simply experience the victories that God wants us to experience 
in this battle that goes on in our lives. So I want you to turn to a couple of passages of Scripture. I want you to turn, first of all, to Genesis chapter 6. Now, obviously, that's right in the very front of your Bible. It's going to be about six pages, eight pages in. How about that? And then turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. And why do I want you to go to both those places? Well, it's because those two places talk about the same man, a guy named Noah. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Noah. How many of you guys are aware that they have built Noah's, a replica of Noah's Ark somewhere up in Kentucky? Has anybody been to see it yet? They keep advertising on TV all the time. And I don't know really anything about it other than it's a great old big wooden boat. How about that? All right. And so the key thing for us to realize is that Noah gives us an amazing example of how to live faithfully in a broken world. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, this is what it says, that the thoughts and the attitudes and the intentions of men and women was on evil continually. That's what it says. So God decided the world had become so corrupt, the only way to deal with it was to destroy it. And what did he do? He looked for a righteous man, a righteous man who's simply in the middle of that kind of a black, dark culture was the kind of person that God could say, I can work through that person to bring redemption and salvation. So let me take just a few minutes. And before we look at Genesis chapter um, 6, highlight a few things. In Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus asked this question, and I would tell you that it is to me a haunting and very daunting question. He says, when I, the Son of Man, return, how many will I find on earth who have faith? Now that's a very, very significant question because it seems to me there are plenty of people who give lip service to faith in Jesus Christ. It's as I've shared with you before, growing up in a pastor's family with parents who were de deeply devoted Christ followers. I grew up from infancy on being told and instructed and understanding why Jesus came. I listened by the time I was 18 to probably several thousands, maybe a lot more than that sermons. Because I think I've told you that growing up the way I did, we went to church on Sunday morning. We went to church on Sunday night. We went to church on Wednesday night. We then would have at least two revival meetings. It would be 10 days each. So we went to church every night for 10 days. We would go to at least two camp meetings in a summer. And that meant that they preached in the morning. They preached in the afternoon. They preached in the evening. So I heard a lot of sermons. And a lot of things that probably been better not to have heard, by the way, to be honest with you because of the confusion it could create. But the reality is this. I knew from just a little guy on what the gospel was. And see, that's what scares the daylights out of me. Because I believe there's so many people. We understand why Jesus came. We understand what he did on the cross. But we've never allowed that to move from our mind to our heart as something we personally accept and believe. And you know, that's why it's so important that we listen to this question that Jesus gives us. When he says, when I come, am I going to find anybody with faith on this earth? He's not talking about people who know who I am and what I came to do. He is saying, am I going to find people who personally know me? And that's the critically important thing. Well, let me just start by highlighting three things about the importance of faith before we start looking at how to live with a faith focus in a broken world. First of all, the Bible tells us that God is looking for faithful people. Second Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts are perfect towards him so that he can show his great power in helping them. Now, here's the thing that we have to just have a mental picture of. God, the sovereign creator of this universe, the God who loves us so much, he sent his son to die as our substitute on the cross. The God who has provided for us 
the only means of salvation. Here's what it says, that it's like he's standing somewhere looking down on this earth everywhere, looking, looking, looking. And what's he looking for? What's he looking for? Is he looking for rich people? No. Is he looking for nice people? No. Is he looking for good people? No. What is he looking for? God is looking for people whose hearts are perfect or people whose hearts are completely devoted to him. That's what he's looking for. When he talks about perfect, he's simply communicating. There is no alloys involved. They're purely focused on devotion to me. And I want to encourage us today to realize that's the kind of people God's looking for. And I don't know what he sees when he looks down on this group right now in this room. Because all I can see is your washed up smiling face. But God looks way beyond that. He looks for people whose hearts are completely and totally devoted to him. That's what he's looking for. And I want to encourage us today to understand that that is the importance of faith. God is looking for people who are really, really fully committed to him. And then the Bible teaches us that faithful people are hard to find. Proverbs 20 and verse 16, everyone talks about how faithful he is, but it's difficult to find someone who really is. Now, let me put this in Rick Addison's paraphrase, all right? It is one thing to talk a good game. It's another thing to walk the game that we talk. There's a lot of people who can say all of the right things. They can communicate all of the right things but they don't live by what they talk about. They don't live by what they profess to believe. And that's what Solomon is saying in Proverbs. He is saying, you know, it's one thing to talk about faith. It is another thing to demonstrate in my daily life. Here's what we're talking about. We're talking about fleshing our faith out, being a faithful person in a broken world. And let me make it really clear. Our world is broken. And if, if you haven't figured out by now, it's a mess. Just turn your television on if you can stand it for about a half hour this afternoon to some news channel, and you will figure out in short order, we live in one broken, screwed up, messed up world. Say, Rick, that's so pessimistic. I'm not a bit pessimistic, but I am realistic when I tell you that when you see the things that's going on around our world right now, and you see how corrupt our world has become, and you see how depraved and fallen our world is, you have to stop and realize that that's the kind of world that we're living in. And what does that world do? It is constantly attacking us. It is constantly bringing into the focus of our lives the wrong priorities and the wrong things to zero our attention on. And that's the kind of world we live in. And the Bible says that faithfulness is the key to blessing. I know all of us want to be blessed. And um, 1 John 5, 4 says, every child of God can defeat the world. You know, as I've shared, we're in this series we're calling the Unseen War. So every child of God can defeat the world. And it is our faith that gives us the victory. That's the key thing for us to zero in on. And I've ta tried to talk about this over and over in this series of messages. We will never win this battle by getting better weapons. We will never win this battle by developing keener strategies. We will only win this battle through the power of God. And all through the book of Joshua, you see how they won their battles. It was what? Not because they had such great military might. They won their battles because of their great dependence upon God to give them the victory. Let me make it really clear. That is nothing more nor less than an object lesson for us to stop and understand that God makes it really clear that the only way that we win this war are not with weapons of the flesh, but through the power of the Spirit of God at work in our lives. So I just want to challenge us today to understand that if we're going to live a blessed life, we must live faithfully in this world. In fact, this is what John goes on and says, no one can defeat the world without having faith in Jesus, the Son of God. 
That's the key. It's faith in Jesus, the Son of God. Well, with that all in mind, let me take a few minutes now and focus our attention on Genesis chapter 6. So please leave your Bibles open there. If you didn't bring one with you, remember there's one in the back of a chair pretty close to where you're sitting. Noah demonstrates for us how someone can live faithfully in a broken world. He lived in a time of extreme wickedness, as I shared a few moments ago. Genesis 6, 5 says this, that the wickedness of the human race had become so terrible that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. If you're on a circle of a couple of words, only evil and all the time. That's where things were at. And so he lived faithfully in that kind of world. And I sometimes have people say to me, Rick, you have no idea what a screwed up place my, or screwed up thing my life is. I have the weirdest family in the world. I have the toughest work environment in the world. I have the most complicated friends in the world. Well, let me just make this really clear. You can still live faithfully in a mixed up, screwed up, depraved world because Noah demonstrates that that is exactly what we can do. And then Noah lived faithfully without the benefits of the full revelation of God. Hebrews 11, sa 7 says this, Noah being warned of God prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Now keep this in mind. This is Genesis chapter 6. Noah, Noah lived several millenniums before a guy named Moses lived, all right? And who was it that God gave the revelation of, you know, all of these things to? It was to Moses. He's the one, was well, a human author of what's referred to as the Pentateuch, the first five te books of the Old Testament. You realize that Noah did not have a single written word that God had ever spoken available to him. Noah did not have an understanding of even the ancient sacrificial system. He did not have an understanding of the coming Messiah. He did not have an understanding of any of those kinds of things. He just knew there was a God in heaven. And what was he doing? Worshiping that God. But you and I have the benefit of this book by itself. This book, the Bible, the Word of God, is God speaking to me and speaking to you. And I can't tell you how many times I find myself dealing with the conflict of this unseen war, whether it's with the flesh or whether it is with the world or whether it's with the devil, wherever it is coming from. And guess what? In this book, I find what God wants to say to me about responding to that. Noah did not have that benefit. I want to encourage us today to realize there are no excuses for us to not live faithfully in this world. Jesus says, when I, the Son of Man, return, will I find faith on this planet? And I can say this. Yes, if you and I will fight the unseen war and experience God's victory in our life in these areas. If not, we're going to be defeated by that war. And I want to challenge us today to understand how important it is that we not let that happen. And then Noah was faithful because he walked with God. Look at verse 9. He was a righteous man, and Noah walked with God. See, walking with God requires a personal relationship with him. Noah obviously knew God in a very personal and intimate way. That's why he's described as a righteous man. I want to challenge all of us to stop and realize that the most important thing that we ever come to an understanding of in our life is not just knowing about Jesus, but coming into a personal, life-changing relationship with him. That simply comes when we ask him to become our Savior and accept his sacrifice as having been done for us. And then walking with God requires obedience. Noah obviously lived a life 
that was in stark contrast to his culture. His obedience is described as a righteous man who walked with God. And I want to encourage us to realize that in a culture that has lost its moral compass, that God wants us as followers of Jesus Christ to live as shining stars in a dark world morally. And as we live in a world that is more and more corrupt ethically, that God will help us to live by his ethical principles in a world that is characterized by the expectation of politicians to lie to us and business leaders to lie to us, employees to lie to us, and a culture that is steeped in deceit and de deception, that God will help us to live with total honesty and integrity in our lives. In the kind of world we live in, then we will stand out like Noah did, a righteous man who walked with God, a righteous woman who walks with God, who lives our lives by God's principles, by God's values. And Noah did that without having this revelation that you and I have that we call God's Word, the Bible. And then walking with God requires living with a God focus. Um, what that simply means is this, that this deal of becoming a Saturday night or a Sunday morning Christian isn't a good, a good option, all right? Because far too many times, I think we look at it and say, that's the extent of where my faith takes me. No, let me make it really clear that what God is looking for are men and women who consistently, predictably live their faith out in the marketplace of life, in the various environments of life, that we live our faith out in that environment. So I want to encourage us today to understand how important that is. And then Noah was a faithful man because of his consistency. Verses eight, verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, consistently, consistency, excuse me, enables us to live insulated from the world. Now, for about a millennium, the church tried to not live insulated from the world, but to live isolated from the world. In fact, you had some of these people that did some very strange things. There was a guy named Simon Stilalide. You can look him up. He wanted to live separated from the world. So for about 40 years, old Simon lived on top of a big pole. Now that gets you up above the world, all right. But I can promise you this, that didn't get rid of the sin nature in old Simon's life. And it didn't get rid of the pressures and pull of the world. In fact, it got him right up there where he could see it a whole lot better. And it did not isolate him from Satan's fiery darts and fiery arrows of temptation because they're there. So we can never isolate ourselves, but Christians have been trying to do that for a long time, and it never works. All we can do is understand through the power of God, we can be insulated from the effects of our culture on our life, and that's what God looks for in all of our lives. And then consistency convinces those around us of the reality of our faith. I don't think that there is any place that consistency um, should be more um, habitually practiced than in our families. Um, <clears throat> you know, my parents, as I shared, were deeply, deeply committed Christians. And um, there was never a doubt in my mind about my mom and dad's deep devotion to God. There was also never a doubt in my mind that my mom and dad were real human beings who had times that they got angry about things, times they reacted in a way that wasn't the right way to react. There were times where they said things that shouldn't have been said. You know why I could stand by my dad's casket as a 14-year-old boy with complete assurance that my dad was in heaven? It wasn't because he never got angry. It was not because he never said something he shouldn't have said. It was not because he had never said anything unkind to me, because he had. But you know what he would do? He would always come back and say, Rick, your dad was wrong 
to respond like that. Now, let me make it really clear that it's important for us to understand that consistency does not require perfection. It requires predictable responses to certain things. I want to challenge us to live faithfully, and consistency requires living faithfully wherever we are at. And I want my conduct, whether I am, you know, with somebody else of faith or with somebody that has no faith, to be exactly the same. Whether or not I am with family and Christian friends or whether I'm by myself five or 6,000 miles away, I want my behaviors to consistently demonstrate faithfulness in my walk with Jesus Christ. I want to challenge us today to remember this, that God says that he is looking over this world for men and women who have hearts that are completely devoted to him. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for people who are perfect. He's looking for people who have deep, deep devotion to him. That's why it is so important for us to hear what, you know, really God has to say to us through Noah's life. And then consistency gives us credibility. Whenever the people around us see consistency in our behavior, then we have the credibility to influence them. And then knows Noah was faithful to fulfill God's purpose for his life. Um, you realize that he worked for over 100 years to build the ark? That's a long time. In fact, I don't remember how long it took them to build this thing, this replica of the ark in Kentucky, but I think it was several years, and that's probably with hundreds or more people working on it who have power equipment, power saws, and everything else under the sun. He spent 100 years building the ark. Now, let me just put it really, really clear that... Um, Whenever we know what God wants us to do with our lives, then we better just keep on doing it consistently and focus on fulfilling that. You know, God made it really clear to me when I was 17 years old that he wanted me to serve him as a pastor. And some of you know that the first weekend of July, we completed 37 years of continual pastoral ministry. And all I can say is this. God did not call me to do this to quit, to throw in the towel. You know, and 37 years goes by in a big-time hurry. But I can promise you this. Here's a guy who did what God told him to do with his one and only life, and he did it for 100 years. Keep in mind there had never been a sprinkle of rain that had fallen on this globe. Up to that point, the world was nurtured or nourished um, through some sort of a mist that came up. And we don't know what that was, and it doesn't matter whether we know or not. The really, really important thing is to keep in perspective that God said, I want you to do this. He said, I want you to build it for this reason. I want you to build it this way. And this is what I want you to accomplish when you build it. And that's exactly what Noah did. So I want to challenge us. Know what God's purpose for our life is and focus on fulfilling that purpose with all of your heart. Noah stands out as what? A faithful man in a broken and screwed up, messed up world because this is a guy who consistently did what God called him to do and fulfilled his purpose in his life. And then Noah demonstrated, faithfully demonstrated faith in God. Twice we have this statement in Genesis chapter 6. He did everything just as God commanded him. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 5. Again, it says he did everything that God commanded him. So Noah demonstrated his faith, I'm sure, in the face of scoffing. Now, I have no idea how people around Noah reacted. <coughs> but if you build a big old boat, <coughs> as big as this thing is, in the middle of a cornfield somewhere, and there's no oceans around, I would suspect there would be a few people that would just have a few things to say about it. In fact, you know... I've been involved in this thing of serving Jesus for a while, long enough to know there are plenty of people out there who will ridicule you if you're really devoted to doing what God wants you to do with your life. I would say today it is so important for us to stop and really, really understand that faithfulness simply means that we demonstrate 
that consistent focus on what God wants us to do with our lives, no matter what the ridicule or the scoffing may be. And then Noah demonstrated his faith in the face of indifference. So there's a whole group of people who would have made fun of what he was doing, and there's another whole group of people who would have been completely indifferent to what he was doing, saying that guy is a fruit loop over there building that big old boat in the middle of a cornfield. I just want to encourage us today to understand that in the face of those who make fun of us, who scoff at us, or couldn't care less about us, our faith must be consistently demonstrated. And then Noah demonstrated his faith was in the person of God. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, by faith Noah. And it talks about him understanding that God had spoken to him. And then, because Noah was a faithful man, the human family was saved. When the door of the ark was closed, all of Noah's family was with him. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And in Genesis 6.10, it tells us that when the door closed, those guys and their wives were all on the ark. That along with every living creature on this planet. And uh, when the door was closed, all of them were safe and saved. I just think that accepting our responsibilities does not allow us to be indifferent to anything that God has to say in this book toward to us about living faithfully for him. And then I would remind all of us that our family is the only earthly possession we can take to heaven. And um, as my mom told my dad, standing by his casket, Dick Addison, there's only one thing I can do for you, and that is to make sure that we're an unbroken family circle in heaven. Then she had the same understanding that Noah had, and that is this that the only earthly possession that could go to heaven with her was this family that God had given to her and my dad. I just want to encourage you to keep in mind that that's one of the most important reasons for us to live faithfully in a broken world because the most important people in our lives should be our family, should be our children, should be our grandchildren if you have them yet, and that focus of our life then means that if we're going to have the kind of influence that God wants us to have, that God calls us to live with a faith focus in a broken and messed up world. Now let me make it really clear that our culture is doing everything it can to work against that kind of focus in our life. In fact, our culture makes it very, very clear that its measurement of success is very different than God's measurement of success. Our culture makes it very, very clear that its definition of pleasure is very different than God's definition of pleasure. Our culture makes it very clear to all of us that through the pressures that it puts on our lives, makes it very, very clear that when it comes to living by the right kind of values, that those things are outdated, that they are you know, not contemporary, and really just don't work in the 21st century. Well, with all of the pressures that we feel around us, then God says, I want you to live faithfully. And how does that happen? It lives that we live faithfully whenever we focus our attention on God and live with a God focus instead of a culture focus. And that transforms every aspect of how we live our lives. And as God looks over this world, looking for faithful men and faithful women, my question is, how many of us in this room will he say, I'm going to be able to bless because of your faithfulness. God's got special things he wants to do in all of our lives. Please stand with me now. If you realize that there are just some areas that you really need God to help you to adjust when it comes to the unseen war that's going on with our world and our culture <clears throat> I'd be happy to pray with you if you have other needs in your life whatever they may be just invite you to join us and let's pray with you today I know God has special things he wants to do in our lives God we're very aware that your Holy Spirit is at work in our lives that you're speaking to many of us about very important things 
that only you can change in our lives. And so I pray today that you would just show yourself to be powerful and extremely engaged in helping us, God, to fight this unseen war with the world and with the culture that we live in, a culture that wants to do everything it can to destroy us. But you have promised that through your power that we can be more than conquerors. And so today, we just pray for every one of us as we deal with these battles and we deal with this conflict with the world that we live in, that we would experience your power at work in an unusual and amazing way in our lives. So we thank you for what you're doing now and thank you for what you're going to do um, this week as we live out our faith in the marketplace of life. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be a, just exactly what we need on this day. I pray for those who've come here who may know about you but do not know you personally, that they would say, Jesus, I want to ask you <coughs> to forgive me for my sins. I claim you as my Savior, not the Savior, but my Savior. I ask you to take control of my life, and I surrender myself to you completely. And I ask you to help me to experience the amazing peace that comes from knowing that my sins are forgiven, <coughs> knowing that I have a restored relationship with you through what Christ has provided for me on the cross. And I thank you for making me a new person in you today. God, we just pray your powerful blessings upon each of us now. And we ask this in your strong name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs>